Oh, good, good morning. So glad to see you guys again. Um, looks like most of you made it back from our money talk last week, so that's good. That's encouraging for me. Um, if you have a Bible, open up to uh, Romans. We're going to hit Romans before we get to Nehemiah. And uh, so I just thought it would be good just to give us a reminder about thinking about the Old Testament, particularly if you haven't grown up in the church. Um, and maybe even if you have, we have a tendency to, to live in the New Testament and kind of be more in the New Testament. And, uh, and so as we were planning and praying and thinking about, you know, the sermon series and we walked through Philippians and um, so we were kind of talking around, Jamie said, hey, why don't we go through something in the Old Testament? And I said, hey, that's great. I really like the book of Nehemiah. Let's do that. And we started studying and Jamie came back and he said, why are we going through Nehemiah again? And I said, I don't know. I'm not really sure. Um, <laughs> But it's going to be awesome. I, I'm really looking forward to Nehemiah, and I think God has a lot to share with us. Um, I will just go ahead and throw out, last week we talked about money. Today we're going to be talking about sin. So we're getting the real big heavy hitters right out of the bat, all right? So just, just knock them out of the park right here, and you can come back for some more later. But I do want to kind of help us just kind of reorient as we get back to the Old Testament. I want, want to also encourage you to just stick with me, all right? The first first half is going to be a lot of information, a lot of history, a lot of getting caught up on where we are in the story. All right, so don't tune me out. Um, and I'm hoping it will be helpful for you to see how we piece this all together. But Romans chapter 15 in verse 4, there's a statement here. There's a text here that I think is helpful for us as we, as we, as we try to engage with the Old Testament. So the author says, for whatever was written in the past was written for our instruction so that we may have hope through endurance and through the encouragement from the scriptures. I think sometimes when we come to the New Testament, it's a little bit like, if you guys, I know not everyone will remember, but help me out. You guys remember the 3D pictures? Like they, they, you would look at this picture and it looked like just a bunch of nothing, but as you stared into it, right, you stared through the picture and all of a sudden this dove, this flying dove would like appear out 3D. Anybody else? Is this? Okay. Very poor illustration. Well, they, they used to make these things and you would stare at them and you would be like, I'm not sure. And if you were like me, it would take a while and you're like, I don't understand what I'm supposed to be seeing. It's not really coming to me or whatever. And that, I think sometimes when we go back to the Old Testament, we get there and we're like, I'm not really sure what to do. I'm not, I'm not really sure. I mean, I know it's, it's a lot of narrative and there's a lot of law and there's a lot of lists and I'm not really sure. And I just think the words here um, um, from Paul that whatever written in the past was written for our instruction. So all this stuff in the Old Testament, all the things that, that the guys in the New Testament as they're learning about uh, you know, Jesus Christ and they're thinking about, uh, thinking in, uh, to the history they're looking back and they're supposed to instruct them about who Jesus is. If you remember at the end of Luke, um, there's these guys that are traveling down this road and they come across this guy and he starts, it says, the, it says their eyes were, were, were blind or were hindered from seeing that this is Jesus. And so they're walking with, with him. And they're like, he's like, what's going on? And they're like, you don't know? And he's like, no. So, well, there was, there was this Messiah, and we, or there was this guy who was crucified, and we hoped that he would be the Messiah. And so Jesus, he just kind of starts talking to him, and the scriptures say that he began to reason with them. He began to tell them about who Jesus was from, from Moses and all the prophets and all the law. He basically took out the Old Testament and started pointing to, to the Messiah, and so when we come to the Old Testament, he says there, it's for instruction so that we might have hope. Well, what is our hope? Our hope is in Jesus Christ. We're, we're supposed to be looking back at the Old Testament, and we have the great privilege now of seeing through the lens of the cross and looking back into the Old Testament. We have a much better perspective of the Old Testament than the people even walking in the Old Testament. They don't always know. They don't always understand what is coming. They're just kind of living this out. It's similar to us when we think about what's coming next. We know the Messiah is going to return, but we don't know all the ins and outs of what's coming next as far as heaven and the rain and the millennium and all all that and we try to figure all those things out and those are all great things to kind of you know want to discuss and work through but at the end of the day we're not really sure we know that heaven is coming we know that that's that's what is coming but we're not really sure about all of those things and so when we look back at the old testament we're supposed to be given hope for endurance and through the encouragement uh, uh, yeah through the encouragement from the scriptures 
so we're supposed to be given this hope because we look back at the people who went through the Old Testament. We look at their stories and we see how God is working and it's supposed to encourage us. We're supposed to see this endurance. What we're supposed to see is that the Bible is really one big book of what God has started from the beginning and what he will eventually accomplish. And so as we look at Nehemiah, we see Nehemiah in its context of a bigger story which is then supposed to help us see our context and understand where we are. It's supposed to give us encouragement, it's supposed to give us instruction, it's supposed to give us the idea of continuing to endure, that we would continue this faith process. So when we look at the Old Testament, what we're going to do is we're gonna see it in its context, but what we're going to try to do is say, well, what does that matter to me now, these hundreds of years later? All right, so that's, that's, that's kind of our goal. That's what we're hoping, that's what we're trying to accomplish in Nehemiah. So flip back to, to Nehemiah. Okay, this is where the history lesson comes in, all right? I know some of you, especially college students, maybe you students, high school students, you're taking history and you're like, okay, Tim, I sat through history class. I don't wanna do this again. I, I wanna just briefly do this, okay, for two reasons. I, I wanna briefly just start us from the beginning and work us all the way to Nehemiah. Nehemiah is really pretty much the end of the Old Testament. But if we don't understand what's happened throughout the history, we're not really gonna completely grasp what is happening in Nehemiah. And I know a lot of you in here are great Bible scholars, and this is, you're gonna be like, okay, Tim, I know all this, but I think there's a, deficiency sometimes in the church where we don't really understand. We've heard all the stories and all the things and we're obviously not gonna go through every one of them. I just wanna give us a snapshot, but I want us to help us see the progression of the Old Testament and where things fit together. All right, so if you've got pen and paper, we're going to move quickly, all right? I know some of you, you're like history, I hate history. Just stick with me, okay? We're gonna get into Nehemiah and it'll be good. All right, so we're gonna start with creation. Obviously, Genesis 1-1, God, does creation. God makes everything. He makes the earth, he makes the heavens, he makes the animals, he makes everything, and then he makes Adam and Eve. He makes humanity, his prized possession. And they're supposed to live together in harmony. They do. They're living together and they walk together and there's this great, perfect relationship and then the fall happens, right? Adam and Eve, they sin, they eat the fruit, and we see that then the world is infiltrated with sin. And what God had hoped for, what God had designed, what he had planned for him and his creation to live together in harmony is now destroyed. And so now he starts on this mission of bringing restoration back to what he has created. So we have the fall and then we have the first promise of the Messiah in Genesis chapter 3 that there's one who is coming that will rescue them, that will crush the head of the enemy. And then we have Noah, right? Several chapters later you get to Noah. And basically what has happened is sin has so ravaged the world that God is basically says, I've got to start over. And so he takes Noah and he puts the family in the boat, right? And they, they're on the boat. He basically destroys the world and starts over and he kind of gives them the same command. He says, hey, be fruitful and multiply. He's like, we're gonna kind of start this thing this over because sin is so terrible, right? So then you have Abraham, right? So you go from Noah and they, people start happening, you know, they, they're fruitful and they multiply and then we, then we find Abraham. All right, you get to Abraham and God has called him out. He makes him some promises about being a great nation and that he's going to give him a, a land and he's gonna take care of him and it's through them that he'll bless many nations. And so Abraham, you have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? And that's, so Abraham has Isaac, Isaac has Jacob, Jacob has these 12 sons. He has these 12 sons, and Joseph is the favorite. You probably remember the story of Joseph, right? He has these dreams, and he tells all his brothers, basically, he's the youngest. He he tells all the brothers, you're going to worship me, and they don't like that dream. They don't like that story, and so they they basically try to slay, they try to kill him, then they sell him into slavery, and then he goes down into Egypt, and he eventually becomes like the second in command, right? And then there's a famine in the land, and all all of his brothers and, 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 and the families come basically to live in Egypt. And that's really where the people of God are really kind of formed together. All right, so you have uh, Jacob, who's also called Israel, where we get the Old Testament Israel, all right? So the Israelites kind of become this large group of people. They're starting to become known as a people. 
And the Pharaoh looks at them and goes, wow, there's really a lot of them. We better get control of this. So he basically turns them all into slaves, a different king than the one who liked, um, uh, than the one who liked Joseph. Different king comes. So then that's where Moses comes in. And Moses comes in to save the day, right? And we know there's this exodus and he takes the people out. And uh, in 1446 is the exodus. Then he gives them the Ten Commandments. This is where you get the laws and the Ten Commandments. This is also where we get the tabernacle and um, where they start to worship God and start to give sacrifices. And then God makes a promise to Moses, too, that he's going to make of him a great nation and that he will be with them. And Nehemiah is going to reference this today. If they will remain faithful to him, that they will be their people. And when they don't, when they stray, that God will call him back. This is very important in the life of Nehemiah. And so then you see the Israelites, they go and uh, they're, they're kind of wander in the wilderness for a little while. And then they, they uh, conquer the promised land, the land that God had promised them. So they go in, they conquer the land. This is where you have the judges that come in. And you hear about these judges where they're kind of the leaders in the Old Testament. But the people are say, hey, we don't want judges. We want a king. Every, all, all these other great nations around us have a king. So that's when you get Saul. Saul is the first king, not, not so good. Then you have David. So David becomes the king, and that's when he establishes Jerusalem as the capital. This is important too. All right, so David establishes Jerusalem as the capital. Then Solomon says, hey, let's build a temple. Right? We don't need the tabernacle anymore. We have this city that, that is our city. And then they build, um, uh, they build the temple. So then they're... they're uh, Solomon is there, and then the, it, the nation of Israel splits. You may have followed this through the Old Testament. This is where it gets really confusing, right? You've got the northern kingdom, and you've got the southern kingdom. All right, so you have uh, Israel to the north, and you have Judah to the south. And you have these two kingdoms, all right? And you have these different kings, and you're working through the Old Testament, and they kind of go back and forth sometimes, but they're kind of giving a history of these kings. Pretty much all the kings in the north are bad, and uh, some of the kings in, in Judah and the south are good. And this is where all the prophets start to come up. So when you hear about all the prophets, they're start interspersed throughout the history. All right, hang in there. We're almost done. 722, the northern kingdom of Israel is overtaken by the Assyrians. All right, so the Assyrians come and they send the people into exile. Um, the king with a really kind of weird name to pronounce, Shemlamlazar or something, he comes and he overtakes them. And um, so the northern kingdom is, is no more. All right? So the southern kingdom is still trying to exist. And then that's when the Babylonians come. I know it gets confusing. Like I thought the Assyrians were in control. I know the Babylonians come and they take over the Assyrians. And then they take over the southern kingdom. And you have King Nebuchadnezzar. All right, if you've seen VeggieTales, this is where King Nebi comes in. All right, King Nebuchadnezzar, he takes over Assyria. And this is in 586, Nebuchadnezzar finally comes in and he conquers the people of Israel. They're completely demolished. They're completely destroyed. He destroys Jerusalem. He destroys the temple. And the people are sent into exile, right? And they're sent back to Babylon, pretty much. All right, so then you have Babylon, and they're in control, and then you have this other group of people. All right, so then 539, Cyrus comes in, and this is really what happens in Ezra. So Cyrus, the king of Persia, the Persians and the Medes come together. I know it's confusing, but this is the snapshot, right? Persians and the Medes, uh, and they take over Babylon. Cyrus is the king, and then we open up in Ezra, and Cyrus, the king of Persia, who still controls the area, he still controls the promised land where the, where the Israelites are, want to be home, he starts then deporting them back to Jerusalem. All right, so the beginning of Ezra, what you have is Zerubbabel, and you have uh, Zerubbabel and, and all the other um, exiles who are returning back to Jerusalem, and they build, they rebuild the temple because they want to begin worship. All right, so they rebuild the temple, and then Ezra comes back, and the second group of people that goes back, and he sees that, and um, he sees some, lots of things, but basically the people um, have been, began to intermarry around the enemies, around the groups around there. And so that's basically where we pick up in Nehemiah, all right? Nehemiah chapter 1, you got your history lesson for the year, all right? Nehemiah chapter 1, this is the context into which Nehemiah hears this report. Okay, that Jerusalem has been destroyed. There is no Jerusalem. There is no temple. There is none of that. And then the people go back. He probably knows these things, that they've rebuilt the temple, um, but there's still problems in the land. 
Are there still some big problems in the land? And Nehemiah gets this report, and this is where we jump in. Nehemiah chapter 1. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. All right, let's stop there. That's enough. Okay. Ezra and Nehemiah are really one book together. All right, traditionally, historically, they were one, probably one book together, and probably Ezra or or the chronicler, if you remember Kevin when we worked through uh, Chronicles, that maybe there was someone who put the memoirs of Ezra and Nehemiah together. So as we go, this is important because as we go through Nehemiah, there are times where it's in the first person where Ezra or where Nehemiah is talking, and then there's times where it's in the third person and it seems like someone else is, is talking. Basically what happens is someone pieces the story together and they put it together in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. But somewhere along the lines, we decided it was important for them to split. All right, so... Ezra, so at, at the beginning, this is the words of Nehemiah. Nehemiah is, account, is, is giving an account, all right, for, for what has happened. Okay, so chapter 1, verse 1, words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. During the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, when I was in the fortress city of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, arrived with men from Judah. And I questioned them about Jerusalem and the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile. And they said to me, The remnant in the province who survived the exile are in great trouble and disgrace. Jerusalem's walls have has been broken down. Jerusalem's wall has been broken down and its gates have been burned down. Okay, so Nehemiah is in the capital of Susa. This is uh, this is the Persian capital. He's far away from, from Jerusalem. Now, if you have the maps in the back of your Bible, you can look later, but they're really, really, really far away. And he gets word and he hears what's going on. His brothers come. Hanani could be his actual brother or just someone that's really close to him, someone that he really trusts. And he comes and he tells them that the people have gone back, but there's a problem. All right, the people are there, but there's a problem. They're in great trouble and disgrace because Jerusalem walls have been broken down. So what is the problem? If the walls are broken down in the city, this is, this is a big problem for the people. This is like the quarterback who doesn't have an offensive line. Right? There, this, is, this is big trouble. It's physical trouble. Right? Because they're trying to live in this city and there really is no city because there are no walls to define the city. The walls would represent protection from the outside world. If, if they could come together in the city of Jerusalem and they had these walls, these walls would bring protection for them. Because they're going back to the city and there's still other groups of people that live around them that are enemies that do not like them. We're going to see this play out in Nehemiah. And they they don't like the fact that these Israelites are back trying to rebuild Jerusalem and the people are coming and they're saying, we're in big trouble physically because we don't have a wall. We have no way to protect ourselves. And then he also says that the people are in disgrace. So what does that mean? Why would they be disgraced? Well, again, we'd have to understand Old Testament and understand what uh, a city meant. So this, remember what this city is. This is supposed to be the city of God. This is Jerusalem, the capital of the Israelite people. When, when people look at this city, they're going to think about the Israelites. And when the people around them look at this city, they see nothing but rubble. And so they have a, a disgrace towards God. So I grew up in, in Mineral Wells. You guys have heard me say that. I'm very proud of that. If you have been through my city, you will look and you, you can, when you drive in from certain areas, you can see this big ginormous building right in the middle of the city. It's like ginormous for us because it's like 15 stories or 20 stories or whatever, but it's very big. And when you drive through my little town, you see it. And all the time I have people, happened just a couple of weeks ago and happens all the time. People drive through my city and they call me and they say, Tim, what is this ginormous building right in the middle of your city? It looks like it used to be so great. And I have to tell them and explain to them, yeah, that's the Baker Hotel. And, you know, 40, 50, 60 years ago, it was this incredible place where all these famous people come, came, and Mineral Wells was a happening place. I know some of you that have been there, you're like, no way, that's not true. It is true. Mineral Wells was like, it was the spot to be. I mean, famous people came, and they soaked in the waters there because they were supposed to make you live longer or whatever. Apparently, people figured out that that was a sham or whatever, and then they quit coming. And so now there's this big hotel right in the middle of the city and people wonder man that looks like maybe your city used to mean something but now it just looks old and decrepit it looks man it it really and so now the people in mineral wells they're trying to like 
raise the money so they can rebuild this thing, right? Because when people come to the city and they see this building and it's big and it's massive and it's not upkept and there's nothing there, you start to think bad things about the city. That's just what you do. And here they are as Jerusalem. It's supposed to be the capital of, of their God. Right? In, in, the, in, in the Old Testament times, these people would build, you, you read about it in the Old Testament, right? They would build these great big palaces or, or great big uh, places of worship for their gods, right? The bigger your place of worship was for your God, the, the more grace, the, the more glory that you would want to give to your God. Right? If your city was strong and it had a strong wall and it was very protective and it, and it had a temple in it to, to your God or whatever and it was very elaborate and ornate, when the people saw your city, when they saw your temple, they would think, man, your God must be incredible. And so here's old Jerusalem over here, been destroyed and ransacked and now they do have somewhat of a temple, though in Ezra it says, some of the people weep and some of the people cheer because they remember what the temple used to be like and it's not near what it used to be, but at least it's something. But there's no wall. There's really no city at all. The people don't really want to live in there. They kind of want to scatter around now because they know they'll be easier to, uh, harder to attack if they're just kind of scattered around rather than just being all together but with no protection. And so they want this wall to be built. And so the people come and they give this report to Nehemiah and they say there's trouble in the land but what we see from Nehemiah in response to what he hears is really incredible what we see is that Nehemiah isn't so concerned about the physical nature of Jerusalem he's much more concerned about the spiritual nature of Jerusalem we see in verse 4 when I heard these words I sat down and wept and I mourned for a number of days fasting and praying before the God of heaven. I said, Yahweh, the God of heaven, the great and awe-inspiring God who keeps his gracious covenant with those who love him and keep his commands, let your eyes be open and your ears be attentive to hear your servant's prayer, that I now pray to you day and night for your servants, the Israelites. I confess the sins we have committed against you. Both I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted corruptly towards you and have not kept the commands, statutes, and ordinances you gave your servant Moses. Let's stop right there. The first thing we see here, we see the heart, the true heart of Nehemiah when he hears these words. Yes, he's concerned that there's not a city. Yes, he's concerned that there's not a wall for the physical protection. But Nehemiah understands what has happened. Nehemiah understands that the people are in the situation they're in because of their own sin. This is a spiritual problem. It's not just a physical problem. There is no Jerusalem. There is no wall. There is no great and mighty Jerusalem because the people have sinned. That's why they're in exile. Remember, God had told them, if you will be my people and if you will obey me and if you will follow my commands, I will love you and I will be your God. But if you don't, I will cast you out and you will be overtaken by other nations and you will be spread out to the ends of the earth. That's exactly what has happened. When, when Nehemiah hears this, he understands this. We're only in this because of our own sin. And even particularly at this case, because the end of Ezra, at, the, at the end of Ezra, yes, they've rebuilt the temple, but the people uh, that are coming back, the Israelites that are coming back, are intermarrying against the enemies. And it's not just that they're intermarrying. That's not a problem like with different races. It's because these people have, they worship foreign gods, they worship idols. And what happens every time the Israelites start marrying people from, uh, from other peoples is they begin to worship their gods and they begin to reject the God Yahweh, their God. And so Nehemiah hears this and he weeps. He hears about the sin when he hears the, that the walls aren't being built and the city is in shambles and there's this disgrace towards God. All he can think about is the sin of the people. They're in trouble. And they're not just in trouble physically, they're in trouble spiritually because they don't have this wall, they don't have this city, they don't have this organization. And so now all these enemies are coming in and, and making them worship these false gods and these idols and Jerusalem is a disgrace because the people are not living for God. It's not just that the walls aren't rebuilt and that God isn't looking good, he's being disgraced because of the walls, but the people are making a disgrace towards God because of their sin. Here they are, they're supposed to be the people of God. 
the Israelites, and they have this history, and they've been sent into exile, and now they've been returning back, and they aren't even there very long, and they start rebelling against God. They start living their own way. And Nehemiah understands that the people have a problem. And so he begins in his prayer by just saying, God, I know who you are. I know how powerful you are. I remember your commands. And then he just confesses the sins of the people and his own sin. He sees that the problem of why, Jesus, of why God is not being glorified, why God is not being honored, is because the people have been living in sin. Then in verse 8, he says, Please remember what you commanded your servant Moses. If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and carefully observe my commands, even though your exiles were banished to the ends of the earth, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place where I chose to have my name dwell. They are your servants and your people. You redeemed them by your great power and strong hand. See, Nehemiah knows his Bible. He understands who God is and who God says he was, and he sees the people, and he sees them for who they really are, and he sees that they are a very sinful people. Even God has been gracious to us, gracious to them, and he brought them back, and yet they're still living in sin, and so he starts confessing the sins of the people, and he says, yes, God, we, we have, we've confessed that we are, sin, we are sinful people, but remember your promise. Remember who you are, that you said you will retur- if we will return that and carefully observe my, our command, your commands, even though we are exiles, banished to the ends of the earth, you will gather us. You will bring them to a place where I chose to have my name dwell. He says, God, remember your promises to us. We are repenting. We need you. And then he says, they are your servants and your people. You redeemed them by your great power and your strong hand. See, what what Nehemiah understands is more than they just need this wall, more than they just need this city, is they need a God who will redeem them from their sins. They need redemption. They need a God to remember them and have grace and mercy and favor on them. That he would make his name great through them. He would forgive them of their sins. And as they come together and they turn their hearts towards God, that he would make them great again. That he would redeem them. Nehemiah knows this is not something that the Israelites can do on their own. I mean, yes, it's about the Nehemiah is about building the wall. Physically, they're building the wall. But the heart behind Nehemiah of why he's going through, through such great links and great efforts to rebuild the wall is because the people need redemption. The people need something to live for. They need a God who forgive them of their sins and give them a purpose and help them live for the glory of God again. That's why he says in verse 11, please, Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to that of your servants who delight to revere your name. We delight to revere your name. Maybe your your translation says, fear your name. Give your servant success today and have compassion on him in the presence of this man. So Nehemiah hears the report and he he understands that the people are in sin and, and, and rebellion against God and now they're trying to come back towards God and he says, God, we need your salvation. We need your redemption. We need you to be our God again. And then I love that he makes this statement. We are your servants who delight to revere your name. Nehemiah says, we want to live for your glory, God. This isn't just about us and our city and our capital. This is about your glory. This is about your fame. This is about your name not being disgraced anymore. But the people around, the people that are living around, they would see us and they would see us living in the city and they would see the great mercy and kindness you have had on us and they would see how great and glorious of a God you are. That's Nehemiah's heart. That's why he wants to build the kingdom. We've titled this Building the Kingdom because it's really more than just about building a wall. Nehemiah understands what Jerusalem means to the people. And they have this place to dwell again as God's people, that they have organization and God is their God and he will be with them and he will do something. So what does that mean for us? Tim, that's a cool story. Nehemiah has a great heart. That's awesome. 
What we see in Nehemiah, particularly here in chapter 1, and we see it over and over in the Old Testament, is a microcosm of everything we know to be true about the New Testament. Right? It's the same story for us in the New Testament. The Bible tells us that we were all enemies of God. We have all sinned against God. We have all gone our own way. The Bible says that we are sinful people, that we live lives disgraceful towards God. That we are a people in trouble. We cannot help ourselves. We cannot fix ourselves. And our sin is going to send us to an eternity separated from God in a place called hell. And that's a reality. And we're in trouble. And our sin is disgraceful. Because we've rejected God. But the good news is the heart of Nehemiah, just like the heart of Nehemiah, we know that there is one who has come who can bring redemption to our souls. See, we don't need shelter from sin. That's not, we don't need a shelter. We don't just need a city that we can shelter from. What we need is someone who can redeem us from our sins. We need redemption. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ has come to rescue sinners. God has not forgotten us. He sent Jesus. This is great news for us. We don't have to live as the enemies of God. We don't have to live as these people who were created for a purpose, but we've rejected that purpose and gone our own way. Now there is, now God has made a way through Jesus Christ to redeem us. Hebrews 13, 14 says, we have no lasting city here, but there is a city to come. See, our response to all this is just like Nehemiah, that we love to revere the name of God. He has given us a purpose, and it's not a purpose to build a city. That's not what we're about anymore, right? We don't, we're not this people who are trying to build this city. We are trying to live for a kingdom that is to come. There is a kingdom that is coming. Jesus Christ is building his bride, and we are a part of what he is doing now, just like Nehemiah is building the kingdom through building the walls of the city of Jerusalem and bringing identity and the people back to God. That's exactly the task that God has asked for us. That we now live and we should say with Nehemiah that your servants delight to fear your name. We delight to honor your name, that our lives are now lived for your glory, that we are about this process of bringing people into the kingdom. It's not just a physical building of the kingdom, it's a spiritual building of the kingdom. And God is building for himself a name. And it is our job to make sure that the people around us, they see how great and incredible God is. And that they would worship him, they would love to revere him and worship him. It's just like when we worked through Jonah. If you were here several summers ago, we worked through Jonah. It's the same thing, that God is desperately after people. Because we're sinners and we need a great God and if we will repent and we will turn from our sins, then God will redeem us in Jesus Christ and he will set us on a purpose. He will set us on a plan to help redeem other people, to build the kingdom for the glory of God. It's not about just making the city look good. It's not about making Southside Baptist Church look good. It's about making God look good. It's about making the glory of God known in the world. The way we live towards God, the way we live towards one another ought to say something about who God is. The things that we're going to learn in Nehemiah about how we can work together to accomplish things, it's not just so that we can build Southside Baptist Church. It's never been about just us. It's about the glory of God. It's that people would look at the people of Southside Baptist Church and how they live together and how they live their lives when they leave this place and they would say, man, their God is incredible. That when we leave this place, yes, we sin, but when we sin, we repent, and they see the grace of God. So we have two ways to respond this morning. Some of you this morning, if I could just be quite honest, you're still living as enemies of God. You've completely turned your back on God. You've gone your own way. The Bible says... And we have all sinned and we fall short of the glory of God. But the incredible news in Jesus Christ is that he has come to redeem sinners. And God loves you. 
He loves you so much that he sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins so that you might be redeemed. So you don't have to live of trying to be moral and trying to do all the right things so you can shelter yourself from the wrath of God. No, the only thing that will shelter you from the wrath of God is the mercy of God found in Jesus Christ. And he wants to call you in to, bring, to being part of his kingdom, to follow him, to love him, to know him. And the reality for the rest of us, we can find ourselves in the Nehemiah story as well. God wants to use us. He will forgive us of our sins. He's redeemed us. And now he wants to use us as the people of God to build his kingdom. That we would say, I'd love to revere the name of God. Is, Is that what your lips would say this morning when you leave this place? And not just, I like to sing the songs that we sing. Man, Curry really picks some great songs. I love to sing the song. No, does your life and your words match up to say, I love to live for the glory of God. Everything in me lives for the glory of God because of the redemption I found for my sins in Jesus Christ. And that's what we're building the kingdom. That's the kingdom that we're building. We're building this kingdom of God, this bride of God, that he will come back and rescue Are you living for the glory of God in your life? Are you living to help build this kingdom that God is trying to build? Are you you joining him in his work? And that's how we can respond this morning. Kurt's about to come up and we're gonna sing some songs and we're just gonna take a little bit of time here. And maybe you need to repent. Repent. Maybe this morning you just need to fall on your face in repentance and say, God, I need you. I know what is true about who you are, that if I'll come to you and I'll repent, that you will forgive me and I can find grace and mercy and redemption. Maybe that's where you need to be today. Maybe this morning you need to respond and say, God, I know your salvation. I've trusted you. I understand redemption, and, 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 but I've been living for my own glory. I've been living for my own way. And you too need to come and repent and say, God, I want to live for your glory. I want to live for your name. I want to live for your fame. The grace that we find in Jesus Christ, that God would give us a bigger purpose.